welcome. Welcome everyone. Tonight we're going to talk about letters, writers, readers, moths, mummies, macaroons, cats, and armadillos, and homicidal sea worms as we delve into more than 20 years of letters from McSweeney's Quarterly Concern. Dear McSweeney's dives into the archives of the legendary magazine to discover what people say back to a publication that has so much to say to them. The book is edited by Daniel Levin Becker, senior editor at McSweeney's. He's the author of many subtle channels and what's good and translator of numerous works. He joins us tonight with an assembly of contributors to the anthology. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much, Allison. I'm going to apologize in advance due to a clerical error. We're actually all going to be talking about homicidal sea worms tonight. Excellent. Um, so any of you who are faint of heart, please, uh, please log off now. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for joining us uh, today to celebrate the official pub date of Dear McSweeney's, um, which I'm happy to report is maybe the most self-explanatory book project I've ever been involved with. It, uh, as its subtitle says, it's two decades of letters to the editor from writers, readers, and the occasional bewildered consumer. Um, the letters were for the most part published in Timothy McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, which is the, um, the roughly quarterly, mostly fiction journal that McSweeney's has been publishing since 1998. There are a handful of pieces that are also, um, that were published online in the listserv kind of thing that floated around uh, the scene toward the end of the 90s and the, uh, in the beginning of the aughts. And um, as Allison said, it really runs the gamut in terms of theme, in terms of um, author, in terms of length and approach. There are a lot of pieces that read like postcards from exotic destinations. There are a lot that read like postcards from uh, the most mundane possible domestic scenarios. Um, in which the authors just managed to, to wring some really fascinating slices of life from their, their everyday experiences. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to some of our contributors who I thank, to whom I'm very grateful for, uh, for helping us celebrate this launch. And first I will ask Brian T. Edwards to read his letter. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Mine is one of those exotic letters, I suppose, written from Cairo, although I'm reading to you from New Orleans, where we're still getting over the power and uh, internet grid, so I hope I don't cut out on you. I wrote this letter to McSweeney's actually while I was in Cairo, working on a, a special portfolio of Cairo, Kyrene writers um, for a public space, which was coming out around the time, and I stopped to write this letter. Uh, it was during Ramadan. Dear McSweeney's, I've never tried to explain why I keep coming back here. It could be that in some ways I don't grasp it myself. I just get on the plane again and off the plane again and then I'm here. I didn't plan this trip, it was an impulse. I had work to do, but that wasn't it. It hit me that, this was, that it was Ramadan and I've never been here during Ramadan. Something unexpected always happens. It might come a hair closer. The answer to one more of my questions about Cairo might reveal itself when I at least expect it to. But also after all the messiness of the past year, it was something of a gift to myself. Every Ramadan I spent in Morocco felt somehow cleansing. I actually like fasting, the strictness of nothing passed between your lips, not, not food, not water, not a cigarette, not even gum or a toothbrush or a kiss, the intensity of it. The night I arrived, I got to the hotel just before 1 a.m. I keep a cell phone for Egypt with an Egyptian SIM card and my Cairo phone number in it. And it runs off of batteries. It runs out of batteries between trips. It uses a Euro plug, two prongs, and the network doesn't work in Chicago. So I can't check it when I'm away from here. But when I turned it on, it's like magic. It reconnects me to this world in a way that Facebook never can. By 2 a.m., I was out with a friend. We ended up at his place talking and drinking the last of the scotch that his British girlfriend had brought him. And then it was almost 4 a.m. and I was teasing him about something when the call to prayer started. I had no idea dawn would come so early. It was still pitch dark outside. It turns out that they moved up, moved up daylight savings time by about six weeks to make Ramadan work a bit better for everyone. And his girlfriend says, you better hurry. So he runs to the refrigerator to gulp down half a liter of water before he can't drink for the rest of the day. When he rejoins us, he says, 
the call to prayer is like a pyramid and I caught it before the peak, so it's okay. Sunset these days is at 6.30 p.m. and it's 97 degrees out when the sun's out, outside when the sun's out, so drinking that water will come in handy. But even so, he sleeps most of the day, no job. Well, he's a writer. The days have a, a special rhythm here in Ramadan. People stay up so late, maybe because of the abundant iftar meals at sunset that stretch out like a month of thanksgivings. Sometimes there's a lighter meal before dawn, suhoor, and then you snooze away the daylight till it starts up again. You're wondering how people with regular jobs can do this. But I have another friend here who works in an office and he met us downtown for suhoor tonight on this boat on the Nile. There was tamia, falafel, and tamarind juice and live music. And the call to prayer started just as we climbed into taxis. I've fasted before, but this time I have too much work to do to struggle through the day without some nourishment. So I modified the law. I'm doing a coffee fast, no food, no water, just coffee when the sun is up. To be honest, it's not so hard. I can't eat for the first few hours after I wake anyway, and then you're almost there. So why not push all the way through? And it's putting me into this state where just as I get to that time of day, when my writing comes best, I'm half hallucinating from the caffeine and the dehydration. And it's something between automatic writing and writing drunk. I love it. And when I go out rushing to meet whomever for iftar, I'm, I'm eager and wired and that first taste of food is so perfect. You really should fast if ever you get a chance. It's 5 a.m. now and the sun is coming up. I'm not sure if it's just easier to stay on Chicago time since going to bed at dawn here is like going to bed when you'd go to bed there. Night here starts when an imam somewhere in the Saudi desert can't distinguish between a black thread and a white thread. Morning begins when the first thread of sunlight scratches the Eastern sky. Those are the hinges upon which Ramadan turns. But I have to tell you about something I saw yesterday that I hadn't noticed before. I was passing under this bridge that crosses over the Nile and then lets out in Zamalek where I'm staying. There were rows of empty tables beneath it. I had made my way between them earlier in the day without thinking about it. But when I came back at about six, they were filled with people sitting quietly, waiting. Someone told me they're called Maidat Rahman, tables of mercy. They're for poor people who can't afford to cook a big iftar or for people who can't get back to their houses in time to break the fast. And they're paid for by rich people or mosques or neighborhood associations. Zamalek is a wealthy neighborhood by Cairo standards. And I don't know if that's why, but the food they brought out looked good, meat and soup and baby zucchinis stuffed with more meat and green peppers. And so I waited there just watching without seeming to watch while the people waited for the call to prayer to permit them to start. One man, dark like a Nubian from the South, had his head down on the table, maybe tired, maybe dehydrated. There was a hush of anticipation a sense of community, of shared purpose. I'm not a religious person, but at moments like that, I miss a connection to something bigger, to something infinite. Cairo has 16 million people living in it. At times when you walk up the busiest thoroughfares, you can feel like a speck, just a granule of dirt in the city where pollution smothers the sky and smears the walls right down to the pavement. It could be I want to be forgotten, to disappear into the 16 million Kyrenes making their way through a city that will forget them, never knew them, breathes them with filthy lungs coated with centuries of grime and anonymity. But then at those tables of mercy, there was a moment. It took me aback of peace and silence and anticipation. It happens each day after depriving yourself. And I was depriving myself too in my way. I was coffee fasting. That brief and gorgeous moment of cool water coming down your throat and into your belly. You have passed another day of glory on this earth and in this city that has been here since the time of Khufu. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for that beautiful letter. Um, what what year was that from? I know it was. From Sorry, yeah, I should have. I should have said that was from uh, 2010. Um, and you published it in um, in uh, McSweeney's 34. Here's the uh, original special issue, kind of seat, packaged in with plastic along with the book about the then still relatively new war and, and occupation of Iraq. Hmm. So it was before, about a year before the so-called uh, Arab Spring and Tahrir uprisings. And I was 
uh, spending a lot of time with some of the writers, the Cairo writers, writing and kind of breaking apart the 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 novel in Arabic. I would say doing amazingly interesting mm. uh, work in comics and so on. And stopped to write that letter to you all. And were any of them? Were you or any of them already affiliated with Mixwingers, or what? Uh... Um, inspired you to send this letter to us? I had been writing uh, some pieces for The Believer um, at that point. And so uh, I hadn't been writing for McSweeney's, but mm -hmm. I think it was sort of the same address. <laughs> wonderful. You uh, you did a really wonderful job subtly interweaving the, uh, the homicidal sea worms <laughs> into the piece. Thank you. Um, so now I will pass the uh, the mic, such as it is, to Marco K. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, Brian. That was that was a beautiful piece. Um, it was a great evocative uh, postcard for sure. This um, this one is more. Uh, if I'm a sea worm, a homicidal sea worm, um, it's more of a um, suicide mission that I. Um, uh, did upon myself um, where I really messed up at trying to get um, my first freelance job. I work as a advertising creative. Um, this is my kind of big, uh, big break uh, for, for real. Um, and I, I really botched it um, by not filling out a questionnaire right. And this letter has a lot to do with internet pop-ups, which haven't all been eradicated, but were even more of a nuisance back in 2011 when this letter ran in the quarterly. Dear McSweeney's, here's what I want to know. When you, when you don't realize that a crime you committed was a real type of crime, and so you fail to tell a prospective employer about it, is that tantamount to covering it up? I didn't think so but this human resources company seems to. When I told their guy Reed that maybe it was a you had to be there kind of thing, but I bet you wouldn't have realized it, it was a misdemeanor either. The voice at the other end of the line was far from sympathetic and not nearly as musical as the name I made up for him might suggest. Trespassing, as I have come to understand, is something that will show up on a background check. Legally, I am not at liberty to say where I applied for this job, but I'll divulge that the company is involved in searching the internet. Given that the place was founded on background checking everything in the entire world, it was probably a little foolish of me not to make a mental sweep of the dusty corners of my life before I sat down for the interview. And of course, the I-9 application I filled out a few days later wasn't designed to help me remember my criminal record, but wouldn't it have been nice if it had been? Have you ever been involved, been convicted of a misdemeanor or felony? Caught red-handed in an unlucky moment of public urination? No judgments here, we've all done it from time to time. Or maybe you and your friends were looking for a secret swimming hole five years ago, and the only path just so happened to cut through some property owned by the Girl Scouts. Think really hard before checking yes or no. Think, Marco. An impractical vision, sure. But consider, to use the internet developer's term, the basic usability of these employment forms. Reed said I had to complete them on a PC. And since my parents lived too far away for me to use theirs, I went to my public library. Once there, so many pop-up windows interrupted my experience that I may as well have been filling the thing out while driving and texting. After each page loaded, I received a warning. This page contains both secure and non-secure items. Do you want to display the non-secure items? The first 15 times I selected no. Then I thought, what if the non-secure items are really important? So I clicked yes the next 35 times. Unlike with the law, there seemed to be no right answer. More boxes demanded my attention, pop-ups within pop-ups. As I finished each page, I was asked to electronically sign it. This brought up another box. To the best of your knowledge, is the information contained herein true and correct? Once with this box, I accidentally clicked no, confusing it with the non-secure items box. 
Luckily, the startled grunt I let out didn't disturb any of the library's other patrons, and I was able to change my answer. But can I really blame my carelessness on pop-up windows alone? A good deal of culpability rests on the soft shoulders of a woman whom I'll call Trixie. Trixie with her long legs, interestingly dyed hair, and mild acne. Unlike Reed, her fake name is telling. She was our travel agent to this secret brook, talking up its amenities, describing her own photos from an imaginary brochure. On our hike to the spot, we passed two girls hightailing it back down to the banks of a sunny river where in scores of law-abiding citizens floated, contended people who didn't want any more secrets in their lives. Mum's the word, one of the retreating girls said, but I wouldn't go up there. Trixie pressed her for more information, but we all knew what was waiting ahead. For a moment, we stood at that spot, what I now think of as my line of liability. And somehow Trixie convinced everyone that the, everyone that the girls were lying. They were trying to protect the secret swimming location, using an antiquated British idiom to throw us off. Though she'd forgotten their names, Trixie admitted that she'd had an altercation with one of them in the past. The police couldn't possibly be hiding out up there, she insisted, only 60 feet around the bend. Seems to me that the dumbest sins are the ones you have to atone for again and again. Lesson learned. Yours truly, Mark O'K. Thank you, Marco, for that sobering cautionary tale. Beware uh, <laughs> of Papa Windows and trespassing on Girl Scouts property <laughs> while trying to get a job at a search engine. That will that will continue to remain nameless. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, just a quick um, note to our audience, if there's anybody in the audience who is a contributor to the book who hasn't um, signed up as a panelist and you want to read something, um, maybe you can get in touch with, I'm not actually sure what the protocol for that would be. You can email me. You should have my email address if we've corresponded about the book, or maybe you can make yourself known to Allison in some way, um, just, just in case. Um, in any case, uh, Thank you again, Marco. And now I'll pass things to Ingrida Martinkus to read her letter. Hi, I was just taking myself off mute. Um, so uh, I wrote this letter to McSweeney's back in 2001, March, and it was just an ordinary cold Chicago end of winter day. Um, and I was exhausted, um, hassled, and trying to get home. Um, and I was hoping for an, a very disengaged, um, uninteresting cab ride home with um, a cab driver that wasn't trying to make perfunctory small talk or trying to peddle me um, some kind of products or anything that would change my life. And instead, I got Bill. So, uh, dear McSweeney's. One evening while sitting quietly in the back of the seat of a taxi, I noticed the driver holding a piece of paper. It looked like a business card. It was a business card. The card dangled between his thumb and index finger as he held it over his shoulder, elbow braced against the passenger headrest. I watched the card for several minutes, swaying to and fro with each pothole hit, traffic light stop, corner turn. Then he stretched his arm through the plexi window opening and said, here, flicking the card towards me, gesturing for me to take it. I took it. It was creamy in color, a bit textured, grainy to the touch. Blank. I turned it around. Written in plain aerial 12 point, 12 point font was Bill, cab driver. His arm still stretched through the window opening, hand empty, fingers wiggling, he asked, could I have the card back? I gave it back and said, thank you. He half turned and smiled a toothy smile. So that was little observation, a uh, moment of everyday joy. Um, and I think the thing that I liked most about it was I was, it was just like a human connection when I least expected it. So, yeah. 
even, and even then a testament to the importance of print. Exactly, aerial font, you know, you wouldn't it think- It's a bad rap. It's it, a horrible, horrible rap. <laughs> Um, so this was one of the uh, one of the pieces in the book that came from the internet. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to to post that to what I assume was a listserv? This was this was before my day. Oh yes. So um, since this was in the early aughts, um, I already was a fan of McSweeney's. Um, the Quarterly Concern was coming out, and um, I had known on McSweeney's website that um, there was a call for, you know, any observations that you might see, you know, funny events that take place or comments or concerns that you want to share, just send it our way. Um, so what I appreciated about that was that McSweeney's kind of was collecting different people's everyday life stories, you know, little smatterings here and there. Um, and that kind of collection that was happening to all these people at different, you know, locations throughout the world, it was just this kind of wonderful community of letters being written in. And it was kind of also a very interesting take on your typical letter to the editor, which normally are very kind of like straight and formal and um, little highbrow or whatnot. But this was kind of, this was a much more personal take on a letter to an editor. Great. I will say this is the, a little behind the scenes editor talk that um, obviously most of my work in compiling this anthology was going through the, the print issues of the quarterly and reading the letters and selecting which ones I wanted to include. And then at one point I stumbled upon this huge trove of internet letters. And I was like, oh man, I got to go through these now. There's really, there are really tons of them. Uh, they're, so they're cataloged by month. They're all available online. Um, and I started to read them and I was like, oh man, I'm never, never going to finish reading them. So I started to skim them and it was, it was a little bit of a slog, but every now and then there was one that would stick out and I would be like, I have to include this. And this was absolutely one of them. It's just such a, such a perfect little snow globe of a human moment. Uh, so thank you. Thank you thank for being willing to let us include it. Oh yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Ben Cohn. All right, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoy this and thanks for including the, I have two letters in this and I'm gonna read one of them. They're, they were two in, um, for me, they're, they're dispatches from a, from a neighborhood. Um, I, I'm calling right now from um, Easton, Pennsylvania, which is in Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, although I lived in Virginia for, for a long time before we moved here about 10 years ago. This is from um, issue 35, also, so 2010 same year as, as Brian's. Um, we lived in an odd to us neighborhood outside Charlottesville. And um, I had moved there from, from Blacksburg where I had the fortune to be friends with uh, the internet, the internet tendencies editor, John Warner. And so I spent time in the, in the first decade working on the website and working on, on lists and contributing online. And then when I moved, um, uh, I, I think I had the chance to just document some of these things and, and send them on to the to the journal, to the magazine quarterly itself. So this is uh, the first of two, I'll just read the one for us. Uh, Dear McSweeney's, the guy across the street is an insurance salesman. He cornered me on my driveway once soon after we moved in and asked if I had term or life. He's an affable if fearful person. His six-year-old son was at our house one time and explain that we should never go to New York. Uh, why is that, Jay? Because you'd get robbed, he said. But why is that? Because they ban guns. You can't bring your gun. Um, and that, for me, was a cinematic moment. A, a lens telescoped out my window across the street, through their brick walls, into the dinner time kitchen to see the conversations between father and son. Um, I didn't begrudge the kid, since I could see where he, where he got it from. Uh, fear must have some basis. Um, that was after his father, the insurance salesman, um, firmly and without prompting, advised me not to swerve my car to avoid squirrels or groundhogs or whatever, uh, especially especially if the family's with me. He barrels down on them. There's no way you prioritize that squirrel over your family's health. Um, I, I took note. Um, I should also park my car facing out, as he does. Um, he's always got the car facing the street for an efficient getaway 
should it be necessary? Uh, when I'm reading on the front porch of my house and he comes home, I see the car pass his driveway, gently brake, and then slowly back in. Um, I, I haven't talked much to my neighbors on the other side and up a few houses, but I know her husband is being treated, treated for prostate cancer. He waves from his tool stock garage sometimes when I drive by. The neighbor behind us, the one with the trampoline, has been dying of brain cancer for two years. When her husband is walking their dog and I come home to find him at the end of my drive, dog on leash two feet from him, a steaming pile of dog shit two feet farther, and he says, oh, that, that, that's somebody else's, that's not mine. I can only shrug and say, hi, Billy, uh, because what do, you, what do you do? What do you say? A girl from the bus stop wasn't at the bus stop for a few days before we all learned that her appendix had burst. Uh, the doctors didn't catch this upon her first hospital visit, and she'd come back late that night, sallow, pale, limp, and pretty damn close to death's door. She was in intensive care for weeks, her internal organs undermined. All reports were that they didn't expect her to make it. They used those words. They didn't expect her to make it. She made it. And when I hear her grandfather ranting at the bus stop about liberals and his guns and who's out to get him, I, I don't engage. Her mother committed suicide after she was born. Her grandparents take care of her. I don't know why he's so hate-filled, but I know there's more going on than, than I see. The latest self-improvement efforts by uh, my wife and I are are about trying to understand other people better. Um, that we suspect will make us less frustrated. Then maybe we can be better people. Um, we've tried a number of things, not too successfully, so this is our newest plan. Our kids are growing up. Soon, both of them will be in school all day long, somehow, and Jesus, I don't know how that happens. Um, I'm not good at dealing with time's passage. I'm a historian who's no good at dealing with time's passage in my own life. Um, I don't want my children to have to justify their own fears and anxieties or point to us. Um, I don't want them to have any, uh, but they'll get them from us and someone else will, um, if lucky or will not, more likely, wonder where they came from. Um, we can't avoid it unless this self-improvement kicks in soon. Uh, so there's that. Um, I was writing because when I got home last week, I saw a new car parked in the driveway across the street. It was, as is customary, parked facing the road in getaway position. I walked in the house, my wife standing in the living room, sorting through the mail, the sun angling in across the floor. Uh, I see they got a new car over there. Insurance sales must be booming, I say. She looked at me, and she looked out the window, and she looked back at me and smirked subtly. No, she said only barely, barely revealing her smile, but enough so I knew that she'd come to understand some essential truth. That's his parents' car. They're visiting. I'll be in touch again soon. Thank you. And that was the end. Thank you, Ben. And you were indeed in touch again soon because you have another letter, which is kind of a sequel from uh, quarterly issue 39, which maybe you can just recap for us a little bit. Yeah, um, so that was, uh, I think I wrote that one as we were moving um, from Virginia to, to Pennsylvania, and it was somewhat of an update on, um, you know, the people who had passed away, uh, like our neighbor from, um, that died from brain cancer, and um, I, I think in the letter I made a reference, uh, I finally realized that we had another neighbor who I'd never seen for like five years, like they lived literally 100 feet away, catty corner, and we just never seen them. And I, I think I have a reference in there to, at the time people were all shocked in, in Abbottabad, like when they got Bin Laden, that people didn't know he was there and how could this be? I was like, I kind of get it. Like, I don't, I didn't know who this guy was in my sight line for like five years. I'd never actually seen him. So it was expanding. Um, if, I re, if I recall this, it was expanding um, my sense of what the neighborhood was and what it meant to be leaving it, and what it meant to be leaving that house and what, uh, it's not like I intended to be all about death, but there was a lot of pain and, and illness all around that house and hoping that we would also perhaps be, be escaping that as we moved out of the neighborhood. Great. So thank you again. This was, um, so we've heard, we've heard a number of really lovely kind of human moments of, uh, of intimacy at different uh, different levels of zoom out, uh, in Marco's case, perhaps too intimate. Um, and, um, 
that's that's really I, you know compiling the book that was one of the the most inspiring and, and heartwarming things was just the way these letters function as this kind of unsolicited or sometimes solicited but un, un, uh, unexpected missives that just sort of um, fill the reader in on these wonderful little moments that are happening all around the world. But um, because it is a McSweeney's joint and it wouldn't be a McSweeney's joint without some uh, kind of madcap gonzo humor, I'm gonna read a letter from Steve Delahoyd, who I believe is in the audience tonight, but uh, decided not to, not to read. And this is a, a quick letter of his from issue 36. Dear McSweeney's, one of the most recognizable lines from Superman in all its various forms is that guy yelling, look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. But in the moment before it's made clear that Superman is flying by, doesn't the line imply that the guy's just some weirdo screaming at people to look up at birds and planes all day? Sincerely, Steve Delahoyd. Um, and because we've got some time left, I'm going to read the first letter from the book, which is from uh, Deb Olin on Firth. And it's from issue 57, which uh, was the McSweeney's 20th anniversary issue. And so among other things, it can't, the, the, as you probably know, the, uh, the quarterly is redesigned with every issue. So sometimes it'll look like a book, sometimes it'll look like a magazine, sometimes it'll look like a pile of junk mail, sometimes it'll be a newspaper, sometimes it'll be a, a cigar box with a comb in it. And um, it's often bundled with these uh, very small one-off productions. And so issue 57 came with a little bound volume of letters uh, from McSweeney's people and from writers wishing us a happy 20th birthday and reflecting on their own uh, decade uh, in their 20s. So this is Debs. Dear McSweeney's, welcome to your 20s. I passed mine much the way you have been so far, carried the same kind of broken furniture up and down flights of stairs, had the same assortment of roommates, the same old appliances that can't be cleaned, though like you, I cleaned the hell out of them. I had similar half solutions and about 100 jobs. I groped. It is the decade for that. High school is over. College, for those who go, ends. There's no further official sanctioned path for you. You are spit out of the system, tasked with supporting yourself. Good luck. And must endure all the tautological admonishments to be yourself. For the first time, you are utterly undetermined. Here's the story. One night, the beginning of my 20s, I was walking to my apartment from the train and came upon a strange structure a giant apparatus of pulleys and ladders and wire. It had somehow unraveled in front of my building. It stretched for half a block, rose two stories high, and was lit up like a vast construction site. As I moved closer, I could see people crawling around on it. They were up on a scaffolding. They were turning large wheels. Not construction workers. Angels in white robes with feathery wings and large eyes, some of their faces so white they seemed chalked, others very dark. It was not a vision, McSweeney's. It was an art installation. Someone had come along and put it there to confuse us. I noticed a herd of people lined up beside it. The head angel was collecting forms people had filled out. She was talking, she was taking the slips of paper and attaching them one by one to a wire. The forms then rode through the maze on the wire, around corners, up to the top, where the final angel stood on a precarious platform, her robes and wings very pale against the dark. She tied each slip of paper to a balloon. Then she lifted to her toes and let the balloon drift into the sky. The sound of peaceful strumming, a soft wind. The people around me were gazing up. We were dull, rumpled, washed out as a newspaper. We watched the slips of paper disappear into the night. We were all wondering the same thing. Could it be so easy to float away what we don't want? I hurried to the table and took a form. I scrawled a shape on it that only I and whoever could see into my mind could understand, but it contained all I needed it to. I was the last one in that long, long line. The line was so long that by the time I reached the front, it was midnight, and the angels in the sky were stepping down off their suspended chairs. They were leaving. I reached out my trembling hand to the head angel, but she said, you're too late, in a nasal voice. 
in English, though a moment before she'd spoken only angel language. Too late? The strumming stopped, and all I could hear was a cold, harsh, howling wind. I'll tell you what I did, McSweeney's. I shoved my form into her hand anyway. I thought she might throw it back at me in a wadded ball and take off running, but she didn't. She groused a little, stomped off, and got a balloon, tied it, and let it go, making a mean face at me as she did. It didn't go gently, McSweeney's. It careened haphazardly and too fast. I thought it might get stuck in a tree, but it continued upward. That paper left this earth. But I hadn't seen the last of it, as I'd believed. I thought we were floating those papers up into the sky to get rid of what was on them, but I was wrong. We were sending out pieces of ourselves, like an advanced team, into the universe. Here I am. 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 I know this because the scrawl pulled me up with it. I felt my feet slowly lifting and following. It pulled me through 22, 23, 30, like a rope dropped into the fire, raising me out of the volcano and on into the future. That scrawl turned out to be my strength, not my weakness. Here you are, McSweeney's scrawl and all. It's you, vibrant, startling, light-filled, headed toward the sky, lifted by angels and air, you advancing. Love, Devil and Unfirth, Austin, Texas. Um, Allison, shall we shall we take some questions? Absolutely. We can take some questions. If folks want to uh, to type their questions into the Q&A box, um, I can read those out. So just go to the bottom of the middle of your screen. I did have one question while we're waiting for um, for folks to to do this. When you were when you were selecting these pieces, Daniel, what what was the what was were some of the criteria? What kind, what were you looking for um, when you were choosing them? It's a great question. I didn't really know what I was looking for when I started looking. I was very much a uh, a fan of the principle that uh, in, in a lot of a lot of searches, you don't know what you're looking for until you stumble upon it. Um, there were a few criteria that I came by eventually. For instance, there's some letters uh, that I really love, um, but that weren't addressed to McSweeney's, that were published in McSweeney's, but were addressed to somebody else, like Davy Rothbard, the guy who uh, founded Found Magazine, wrote a letter to his little brother, I think, about what to do in the event of it, like how to distribute his possessions mm -hmm. in the event of his death. And that's a really beautiful letter. Susan Strait also wrote a letter to, um, to one of her kids about just sort of growing up uh, in a racist world. And they're really wonderful touching letters, but they didn't quite fit the criteria of, uh, and I think this was even before we knew that the book was going to be called Dear McSweeney's, but they didn't say Dear McSweeney's, and so they weren't ultimately eligible. Um, because I think there, there's, there's a really interesting way that I haven't theorized in a particularly interesting fashion, but that when you read all these books and these letters keep being to McSweeney's, they keep being addressed to this publication, but they're also addressed to you. You're, you get to read them, you get to listen in on these, these dispatches, these moments of human interaction and intimacy and strangeness. And I think that's, that's something really special and it sort of would have broken the spell to have, have to keep in your mind a third or a fourth um, addressee interlocutor. Otherwise, there weren't really very many uh, criteria. I didn't, I pretty quickly decided that I wasn't going to do, that I wasn't going to organize the book by any explicit organizing principles. So they're not in chronological order. They're not thematically grouped. It's just sort of, um, I approached it basically the way I would approach a mixtape, which is to say you start with something strong and then you know, as Nick Hornby says in High Fidelity, you have to up the ante right after that, and then you can kind of find a rhythm, but you have to keep changing it up every now and then. And so in a very completely subjective way, I um, just sort of would, would read, read each letter, um, figure out what I wanted to go next, sort of let that wash over me, and then look among the almost, probably the slightly more than 100 that I'd earmarked for inclusion and say, which which seems like it's gonna respond best uh, after that. Um, 
think that's it. I might be might be forgetting some some important but mundane. Can, can, uh, can I ask you a follow up? Right here? Yeah. Can I ask you a follow up question to that? Since um, you did you see, even though you didn't organize the book chronologically, did you feel over time reading through them all that that the letters were changing in some way? And I'll tell you why I'm asking that question is that like one of the most amazing things about well, actually answer the question, then I'll tell you. I have I have some theorizing about this, but I'm curious what you saw because you you're one of the few people who's read them all, probably. Yeah. The um so one thing that's really interesting is you can it's sort of actually easy to divide them into two segments because there's a a whole series of issues of the quarterly in in the 20s uh, that don't have letters. So there's sort of the the first uh, 15 to 18 issues had letters very consistently. And then sometime in the 30s, the letters picked up again. And it's a little bit uh, facile probably to to generalize, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, I think in in the first set of these, McSweeney's was certainly much, uh, much more engaged in the process of figuring out what it was. Um, it was a lot of uh, the people, it was a lot of Dave Eggers and his friends and people who were sort of already in on the in crowd, figuring out what the publication was going to be, what it meant to write a letter to the editor. There are a lot of uh, letters from pseudonyms um, in those early issues, which was kind of a headache to, to track some of the people down. Um, there's a guy named Gary Pike who turns out not to exist, uh, whose letters are consequently not in the book. But I urge you to go back and, and find them in the first. He has he pops up here and there in the first ten issues or so. Um, and I, th- I think of those as really experimenting with the form of a letter to the editor in a really compelling way. And then after the hiatus of the letters, they read to me much more like postcards from people who are already writers. They already have careers and their careers are taking them places. They're on a book tour or they're about to launch their new book or they're doing some work that already has uh, sort of placed them in this orbit. And the dispatches are a little more, um, I don't wanna say professionalized, but a little more um, streamlined in terms of the message they send. There's a little less, what I read as existential wondering about what am I doing by writing this letter? Now let's hear your theory. No, 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 it's interesting. I mean, the first part, like McSweeney's, you know, I was thinking when Ingrida was talking from 2001, you know, was was changing so much about the way people wrote and read for that, mm-hmm. for a generation, um, that there is, you know, that kind of, you called it the addressee, like you're writing to McSweeney's. And actually, by the way, you asked me what caused me to write the letter. <laughs> I totally forgot the whole history of it. I actually was asked to write for the newspaper issue, um, that letter, and it was it got bumped to the next issues. But so it was actually solicited. I can't remember if it was solicited as a letter or as a travel piece that was then rewritten mm. as a letter. I can't, but anyway, um, but you know, the, the, that there was, it was changing McSweeney's every issue, whether you knew the writer or you didn't know the writer was changing the way a lot of people were writing and thinking about writing. And so the letters became this place to try that out and to, you know, kind of have this, um, you know, you, you were writing to everybody who was reading McSweeney's as well mm-hmm. as McSweeney's. <laughs> so make what you just said totally confirms that those first ones were very experimental, but then later after the gap, you know, I was interesting that so many of us wrote right, right after in the mid thirties, mm-hmm. um, you know, became a more literary space, obviously, but it was also like, you knew you were, you weren't right. If you write Dear McSweeney's, you weren't just writing an essay or, or uh, an observation or a piece of fiction. You were writing to, you know, the people who read McSweeney's. And just like you said, you know, there's a certain range of stuff people were doing there that was either madcap or literary or whatever. So it's a really fun thing to write, you know, because you felt who, who your readers were going to be. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a unifying thread in that all of these letters are pieces it would be pretty hard to publish as anything else. You know, although you said, you know, maybe maybe yours was commissioned as a travelogue. Every now and then there's some there's some pieces that would work as a straightforward travelogue or as a straightforward essay. Some of the, or just as, you know, a lot of them read sort of like they could be just whacked out Facebook rants. Like uh, I think Jonathan Lethem from the first, 
first, second, or third issue writes a letter that's just exclusively about Jerry Lewis's film career. There's no, there's no, um, there's no introduction. There's no intro, no outro. It's, it's not like, hey, dear McSweeney's, I've been thinking about this, or something in your last issue made me think about Jerry Lewis. It's just, uh, dear McSweeney's, bunch of information. Sincerely, Jonathan Latham. Um, but I think you're totally right that um, after this this period of kind of existential searching, um, in a way, it, I want I want to say the letter section was was a victim of its own success. Except I mean that without any negative connotation. That like the success of the searching was this thing that became almost a known quantity, but a known quantity. Uh, that people knew was a place they could experiment with this kind of this kind of writing. We do have a, a couple of audience questions here, um, and folks, if you'd like to get your your questions in, type them into the uh, into the Q and A box. A question from Victoria, who says she's a publishing professional from Minneapolis. I'm interested in hearing from the panelists on how you select which aspects of your experiences are most interesting and how you connect those snippets into a cohesive piece. I think I can just go ahead and answer for everyone and say homicidal sea worms. Um, I, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, that's okay to start. Um, I, I think that, you know, that kind of thing that Daniel was talking about a little bit of like a shout in the dark um, felt like it was a really good spur. And I don't write, I, you know, this is like my only piece of nonfiction that I've like ever written <laughs> practically, uh, the, the, probably honestly. Um, uh, and I, I, I found that um, this really like specific lens on this little individual moment um, was, was really, um, you know, something that I, I really enjoyed. I also realized, like, I kind of told this story, like, backwards in a way, which felt, which again, like, felt narratively really fun to do, um, and I didn't feel constrained by, like, another kind of format, like an essay or something like that, um, so I guess, like, the idea of, like, selecting this, um, again, it just, it kind of had that, like, it is a letter thing, like, it had a letter, like, quality to it in that um, it, it, it was really, like, targeted about, like, a very specific thing. I think, you know, Benjamin, your, 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 your letters, like, did that as well, like, a very specific, like, lens on a, on a character moment. Yeah, I mean, I can add on to that. It's, um, I, I think, in my case, picking the what to include or what to focus on was more about the the style so that I, I have um, I don't I don't think I intentionally compartmentalize things but I have like an academic life which has a very specific kind of writing and I had been writing a lot of things for the website which was all just humor writing completely fiction and not serious on purpose and then this was like this third category where I just had the chance to be plain like I just wanted it to be I didn't want to have flourishes. I just wanted to be straight down. So it wasn't so much about the material as like the, as choosing the, the tone. And I, you know, I always wish I could have done, I mean, it's, it's not over. I still could do this, but I, I really enjoy for some reason, just that straight tone. And this gave me that, this gave me an opportunity to do it. And I, I forget if, if somebody had asked her, I was encouraged or if I just sent it in and now I don't remember so just randomly, um, I, I can't remember who I sent it to. Like, um, so we've got uh, Daniel's Jordan seems like a name I remember. Was there a, was it Jordan? Yeah, um, it's prob probably Jordan. Yeah, Jordan so I, I'm, I'm just forgetting. Um, I don't know if there was a call or if it was just from other connections. Like, yes, write something and send it on. But um, I, I took the chance for it. And, um, I, I enjoyed the experience. Does anyone else want to take a bash at that one? And Greta, you want to go? Sorry, I was on mute. Go ahead, Brian, if you want to. No, go ahead if you're ready. I've, I've, I've... I, well, I was just going to say, I think it's like these little snippets of moments. It's almost like a journal entry that you just kind of throw out. And, you know, like Daniel was alluding to, this was a wonderful exper experimental platform where you're almost reaching out to a friend or a pen pal in this lost form of letter writing, but it was, you know, for me, it was an online kind of 
submission to like uh, uh, a friend or the, the, the public just to share um, a moment that I had, like that human connection that I had that I wanted to share with others. And I kind of look for that with other pieces of writing, you know, again, kind of like little, little everyday moments that sometimes I build into larger stories or sometimes it's almost like a piece of like flash, like a, just a flash everyday occurrence. Yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, mine being a letter from Cairo um, and having been, you know, it was also sort of about like this little phone. I, I realized I should have said it was 2010 because it wouldn't make any sense today. A lot of what was happening, this little tiny phone I used to carry back and forth. I had a little envelope of SIM cards because I was doing a lot of, spending a lot of time in Morocco and Egypt and Tunisia. I was writing a book about, and Iran. So I had all these little SIM cards and then I would, but the battery would run out of the phone and literally I'd plug it in and then messages would come in. So the idea, and they were like tiny little texts, you know, like things where you use the digits to like push it four times or something. And, um, but you know, then I'd start to think about when I had been younger and you know, some of us might remember, I don't know, aerograms or, or those little pieces of blue paper you'd write. You'd only had a limited amount of space and they were so thin. Thank you for nodding. I was like, oh, please don't remember these. And you know, you had a, a, a a forced limit to how much you could write when you're sending a message back. So in some ways, the letter, I really, you know, which was kind of trying to convince friends or people who are reading McSweeney's or McSweeney's itself, that it was really cool to fast during Ramadan in a Muslim majority country, which is what I would, anytime I was in a country that everyone was fasting, I would do it. And I had different sorts of experiences, but so that I guess I was thinking about the aerogram and like writing the letter, not an email, of course, but like, you know, how you would write to someone who was like you're pleading with in a way. I don't know. So I think you tell stories and then it just becomes about any kind of choices you make in creative nonfiction or whatever you want to call it, because it, it obviously goes into the essay, but it's much more. It's a letter. I mean, that's what's fun about it. I have no idea anymore, Daniel, whether it was written, I got to find it. I lost all my old emails, but whether it was written as a travel piece that I rewrote, or if I, I think it was probably a letter. By the way, that newspaper issue has, should have a book written about it itself because it was a mad, crazy issue that they over commissioned and they had so much stuff. So there was just like, we got to bump a bunch of stuff. So, but it, I think it was probably, it, it was definitely writ, written as a letter somehow. <laughs> It's great the way you, you're when you're writing a letter, you're asking someone to to hear it and you're you're asking someone, listen to me and hear what I'm saying. It's a question more so than than a lot of other types of stories. We have a question from uh, I think we've got time for yeah We've got time for one more. And um, Pamela wants to know for a person who isn't familiar with McSweeney's, are people still writing to it and how are the letters changing? Um, yeah, people are absolutely still writing to it. The letters, I think we, we talked a little bit about how they're changing. I think a lot of the a lot of the letters that you see in the issues that are coming out these days are from writers who are friends of McSweeney's or who um, it's almost like um, I think publishing a letter in McSweeney's quarterly is almost like publishing an essay the way you would, um, you know, write an article for New York Magazine a couple months before your book comes out just to sort of seed a little exposure. Um, and I say that uh, meaning meaning for it to sound completely uncynical and uncalculated because the, you know, it's um, to tie it a little bit back to the previous question, I think with maybe with the exception of travelogues, um, I think of letter writing as um, whether it's a lost art or an email or a text or whatever, is you sort of know when the experience hits you. You don't like, at least I don't set out on a given day to say, I'm gonna write a letter to, to this person today. It's something that happens to me, something that I see, something I experience, something I overhear. And immediately that sort of comes to me as an experience that has this sort of ancillary, like um, who it's addressed to sticker. Like I know, I know who I want to tell this story to and I know what I want to say about it. And so I think that's, that's what people are still um, doing even if it's become a little more codified. 
uh, in the quarterly currently. But every now and then there are still stories um, that come that are told in the form of letters from people who don't have books coming out, people who are just readers, people. There's one, there's one, <laughs> this is not really the same thing, but there's a letter somewhere in the book by uh, from somebody who has purchased a bag of McSweeney's beef jerky uh, because there is actually a, a brand of beef jerky in Canada named McSweeney's saying uh, the bag that I just bought was not as good as usual. And it's printed, printed with a, a letter from somebody on staff saying, um, afraid you've got the wrong McSweeney's rest assured our books taste even worse than uh, that, that bad batch you got. Um, so there is still, yeah, short answer, yes, there is still that space and it's really wonderful to see people uh, exploring it and, and using it to sort of test out new ways of telling stories to this strange, unspecified, but um, inevitably wide and interested audience. Thank you so much for, for the, leading this discussion, Daniel, and thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Um, thank you to our, to our panelists this evening for your wonderful words, and thank you to our audience. The book is Dear McSweeney's, and um, we posted the link in the chat. Uh, oh, there you go. You can see it. And we posted the link to purchase from Seminary Co-op in the, in the chat, so you can go ahead and hit that link in order. Uh, but we hope everyone has a wonderful night and joins us for a program again soon. Thank you to everyone. Thank you so much, Allison. Thanks to Seminary Co-op and American Writers Museum. Thanks to our panelists. Mm -hmm.